but look up is about Rocket, young girl, she's six years old, and her brother Jamal, who's a teenager, and like any typical teenager, he's very much about his social media, his mobile phone, and all the rest of it. Not to sort of, you know, uh, generalize all teenagers, by the way, but that's my experience of teenagers. And um, Rocket is obsessed with the stars and space, and she wants to see this phenomenon that's happening called the Phoenix Meteor Shower. And um, she's trying to get her brother to see it with her, as, long, as well as all the people from her neighborhood as well. And this story just follows them on that journey for that day to go and see this particular meteor shower. Um, the idea from Look, for Look Up um, originated from uh, an incident that Nathan had. This Nathan likes to tell this story. So Nathan was walking in the park, I believe, with his girlfriend, and he was on his phone and he was, you know, she was talking and he wasn't listening and he wasn't looking up and he walked into a lamppost. Yeah, so this is the inspiration, the initial inspiration for Look Up as told by Nathan. And uh, when, it, when, when it all came about, Nathan approached me um, initially without telling me this particular story, but he approached me and he approached me in the sense of he wanted me to design the character of Rocket and um, he gave me like a really brief description. You know, I want you to design a, a, a black girl that's obsessed with space. She's got glasses on and she's got big hair. That was my description. And then I went away from that, um, put together a mood board and, and got some images that Nathan had sent me as well. And then thought about what I wanted this character to, to sort of say to people in terms of who she is, how she moves, what kind of girl is she? And the inspiration for that came from one of my nieces. So I have a, uh, a very lovely niece, I'm 10 year old, her name is Sarah, and she is like the most curious child in the world, as, according to me anyway, her <laughs> uncle. And um, you know, I, I wanted to see if I could capture that in Rocket's design and her mannerisms. And I think I did, I believe I did. Apart from the obvious reasons why. Um, I think the main reasons why it's important for me to, you know, make sure that all children from everywhere get access, the same amount of access to good quality books is because you, I feel like you just don't, you don't know what's out there until you see it, if that makes any sense. So like, if you're not exposed to certain kinds of books, it's hard to, or difficult to envision yourself in certain places in the world or to see yourself, to see positive and accurate reflections of yourself in, in the world. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's my answer to that. There's more that I could say. I mean, in terms of just equal opportunities all around, like, it, it's, it's fair. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's unfair for like a certain demographic of children to have something that all children should have access to. Something so almost simple as good quality books. Do you know what I mean? Good quality books that offer a range of representation, a range of um, experiences, and just, you know, a, a range of richness in imagination. Like it's, it's just massively important. My, my inspirations range quite a bit in terms of um, which illustrators inspired me to become an illustrator. So it's, it's a bit funny in places. Um, I had like typical kind of inspirations like Quentin Blakes and Ronald Searle, absolute masters in their field. Um, and then there were some off the sort of path ones. There was a guy called Jim Marfood who really inspired me in my early 20s. To, into my 30s and um, he was he's a comic book artist and um, he's an American comic book artist and he's amazing like he's you know not only do I look at the work of the artist I also look at them as a person their life what they experienced the ups the downs the journey that they went on in terms of how they got to become an illustrator and he was one of the people that really really inspired me because it was all about the craft like he had a dedication to the craft that I, I hadn't seen anywhere else. And he spoke quite openly about um, the journey and he also documented his journey as well, which is what inspired me to start documenting my own. And um, yeah, he was a massive inspiration. Still is, still around. <sighs> Let's just put it this way. You can have a picture book with no words, but you can't have a picture book with no illustrations. 
So as far as I'm concerned, and this is not, you know, no shade to any writers, um, you can't, a picture book would be non-existent without pictures. So the pictures are like literally everything in a picture book. The text is important. The, the marriage between the text and the um, images is also important, but you can't have a picture book without pictures. So one of the joys of um, making picture books for me is that you as an illustrator get to tell a different story to a degree in the visuals that you put down. And you know, the testament to me of a good illustrator is how well you manage to strike the balance between telling the actual story that's been told in the text and different little narratives that you've woven into the illustrations. So, you know, um, and also that contributes to the fun of that the fun that parents experience and children experience when they're reading the book. <laughs> to, to be honest, I don't have any actual solid tips apart from don't skim over the pictures and focus on the text. Like um, really clever illustrators tend to hide things in the pictures, things that help to bring the story, flesh the story out even more. So make it a challenge to look at the pictures and talk the children through the pictures if needed. You'd be amazed at the things the children pick up. And you know, e even I, there are some things in the, in the picture book that I didn't even realize I'd put in there that children have picked up and been like, oh, I like that. You know, um, we had one particularly amazing review from a girl in America who, started off reviewing the book and then she just lapsed into this whole dialogue about the cat in the book and how amazing the cat is and how it's everywhere in the book and again this was just something that I did as a companion for the character but it's something that children have really really taken on board and gravitated towards. My biggest challenge is when creating books for the very young, believe it or not, are the adults that's my biggest challenge. Like children tend to, you know, and it's not to say children are simple and they tend to like everything, but they find the adventure in a lot of things. Whereas adults are hypercritical about texts that are meant for children. And that's not necessarily a bad thing because we do need to have, you know, some critique in the picture book realm. However, I think there needs to be a balance between being critical, constructively critical, and critiquing it from the perspective of an adult. It's massively important. There is, uh, there is you know, for, for example, um, you, you can't visualize yourself in a role in life, in this world, until, or it's hard for you, should I say, to visualize yourself in a role in this life until you see a representation of yourself in said role. Um, an example that I'm gonna give is a little bit off topic. Um, Bernadine Evaristo recently won the Man Booker Prize. And, you know, as a newbie to the industry, I didn't even know about the Man Booker Prize. I knew that there was such a thing as the Man Booker Prize, but I didn't know about its significance to the literary world until I saw a black face winning and for me that changed everything I did a lot of research I looked into it and then it became a space that somebody like myself could be in all of a sudden so in answer to the question it's massively important for children to see themselves it's massively important for everybody to be able to see themselves represented across the board whether it's in literature or in literary spaces it's massively important So this feeds back into what I just said. Um, again, it's, it's massively important. Again, as an illustrator coming up, um, I did graphic design at A level, I studied at university, I didn't do illustration. And one of the reasons why I didn't do illustration was because I've never seen anybody like myself in illustration, doing illustration. I just didn't think it was a space for me at all. And it sounds really silly because I do consider myself to be a fairly intelligent person, but I couldn't link I couldn't make that jump. I couldn't link the two. And it's because I didn't see anybody like me doing it. And even how I ended up here right now, it was a series of very, very random and fortunate events. Like I had no idea that 
I didn't, I didn't intend to get into book publishing. It just happened. And I didn't think there was a space for someone like me in it. But now I realize that there is, and it feels like I belong. So yeah, it's, it's massively important. If you don't see something, it's hard for you to envision how you could possibly be that thing. I saw myself reflected in terms of how I am as a person, right? Um, how I am in terms of my ambition, my imagination, um, things that I wanted to do, um, just characteristics of myself as a person. Did I see myself represented visually? No, not at all. Like I, there were no characters that I can recall in any picture books growing up that looked like me. Um, and when I say look like me, we did have the amazing Graces, but Grace is a girl, I'm not a girl. So, you know, there, there, there was a point that, that um, there was a point that I could relate to, and then beyond that point, nothing. So, no, the answer is no, I did not have that representation as a kid. I didn't, because it very much works on a subconscious level. Like you, again, it, it, it's like a part of your brain switches off or it isn't switched on because you're not seeing that representation. You're not seeing it. You become so hardwired to not seeing it that it becomes the expected norm. You know, not seeing yourself re represented. It's just like, okay, cool. You just sort of accept it as we plod on through life. And it isn't until someone actually highlights it and points it out that you start to notice. And then you look at everything that came before. So we look at like, um, when, once this got highlighted for me, I started to look at the representation that does exist for young black men in cartoons, in, um, in, in popular kind of culture and things that we take in. And it always seemed to revolve around sports and athletics and the same tired tropes being trotted out over and over and over again. So it made me start to question representation across the board. You know, if we're only given one image of ourselves, you know, it, 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 it severely limits our aspirations as people. I have just wrapped up the second book in the Look Up series. It's uh, coming out, it's gonna be announced soon. It's called Clean Up, it'll be announced soon. I've also just wrapped up my first book in a series that I'm working on for Macmillan with Swapna Hadao um, of Dave the Pigeon. She's an amazing, amazing author and I'm really, really looking forward to that coming out because that was so much fun to do. Like, it was so much fun to do. Um, so it's called, um, well, it's due to be announced, but I think by the time this video makes it to you guys, it would have already been announced. It's actually called My Dad is a Grizzly Bear. Um, and it is just super fun, like a really, really super fun picture book. Um, I'm also working on a new series for Bloomsbury called Space Detectives as well, which is really, really fun. It's a young fiction series and it's really, really fun. Um, and I'm working on a soon to be announced picture book with Penguin as well, with a particularly fantastic author who I cannot tell you about yet. So watch this space for that announcement.